Uh, welcome to National Science Day 2022. Uh, so today we have a lecture by Professor Ramanujam, our own jam. Good morning, everyone. It's a, always a pleasure to be here in this auditorium, and it's a pleasure to be here to greet you on National Science Day and uh, talk to you. Um, I thank uh, Professor Ravindran and Arijit for uh, this invitation. Uh, Interestingly, I, you know, like Arvind said, I've been in the institute for a very long time, but uh, I think I have talked about these matters only a couple of times over the very long time. So I thought uh, some of these might be of interest to everyone here. Um, the, the government is celebrating science today and, uh, you know, National Science Day is an occasion for celebration. And, uh, well, you know, group of scientists, uh, at IMSC, you know, what does celebrating in science mean? So I thought rather than talk about science, I would talk about something that uh, is uh, dear to me, which is mathematics and science education, especially at the school level. And uh, in this institute, we have had uh, <coughs> many, many occasions to reach out to universities, schools, teachers come here regularly. So there is, you know, something very unique about IMSC and, and its relationship to uh, teachers and students. So I thought it's appropriate to take up this question here. Okay, so you can always write to me, do feel free to write more. Then, so here is a science classroom, class 9, and subject is Newton's laws, very routine one. And you can ask, you know, you walk into any classroom anywhere in India and ask, what is Newton's first law, what is Newton's second law, what is Newton's third law, and you will get a nice recitation. In whichever language, Tamil, Kannada, Malayalam, or English, or whatever, you will get a, you know, all children in a nice chorus saying, everybody which is at rest in a, or in a state of uniform motion continues to be in that same state unless an external force is applied on that body, you know. And whoever says it fastest feels very good about it. Okay, and there is a discussion and okay, here is my this thing I am saying, look, I mean, consider a sleeping dog. After all, rest usually means that, right? At rest means, you know, sleep is a very good definition of this. And then suddenly it wakes up and starts running. Where is the external force? And then children say all sorts of things. Uh, noises. And say, ah, but you know, but you can always put some glass dome around the dog so that noises won't. No, there are vibrations on the earth and so on. Then I say, okay, we can do, take rid of that. Somebody says biorhythm. <laughs> okay. Now, what is biorhythm got to do with external force? Some children say, there is, maybe there is an internal force. Hmm? And that is why the dog wakes up. Now, by this time, the teacher is seriously worried. I mean, okay, I invite you to for the science club discussion, you know, you are the scientist, you are supposed to be discussing with the children and you are, you know, confusing the children, talking about all this and um, I said, but the loss is external force, right? That What can, what mean? Are there internal forces? And so all this tamasha is going on. And invariably when such discussions happen, there is always one kid who says, you know, sir, Newton's laws don't apply to living beings. So, I say, okay, you know, democratically, let's take a vote on this. What do you think? Do Newton's laws apply to living things? All children say, no, Newton's laws don't apply to living things. They apply only to balls rolling down a plane, whatever, whatever. So I write on the board and the teacher is furious by that. You know, look, what are you doing to children? You know, you are confusing children endlessly. And I invite you as scientists to talk to children. Is this what you do? I said, but we have to explain this, right? And, uh, okay, so that's another story. So, actually, this was a part of a study I was involved in. I mean, I can't glorify it with the term study and all. I say it now, I don't know what else to call it. It's just that I was, in, you know, doing class observation at the time in different schools. And uh, there are three topics that I had picked to see what actually happens in classrooms. One was Newton's laws. Another was Mahatma Gandhi's assassination which is again in secondary school, it pops up in uh, one of the things. So one of the most poignant moments of uh, country's history, right? A country gets freedom, 
August 1947 and January 1948, Mahatma Gandhi is assassinated. And I don't know what genius made me pick, pick this thing in mathematics. I wanted to pick something in mathematics, something in science, something in history. And in mathematics, I picked certain thirds and radicals, probably the worst choice. And uh, so the idea was to see, and, and there was some, you know, Chennai Corporation School. In fact, Taramani Corporation School, that right? you can go and see, Thiruvannur Corporation School, and uh, Abacus, and, uh, you know, several schools, they were quite a range, PSI School. So these were uh, very different kind of schools, and I wanted to see how these lessons are actually conducted in the classroom. And the idea was to look at what the curriculum says, syllabus says about that unit, what the text, textbook actually says, what actually happens in the classroom and then actually I did, went further, looked at their half yearly question papers and you know uh, annual exam question papers, got the answer sheets from the teachers, saw what children had written and then I also had math club, science club discussions with students and with the teachers separately. So the idea was to see the entire process for these units. So the idea was that you know there seem to be so many gaps between curriculum and syllabus and textbook and what actually happens in a classroom and most importantly exams, what questions are asked and what answers are written because that's after all the real reality that children particularly care for. Now I must say that uh, yeah I mean a very sad tale altogether. And you know, the worst was the surge and radicals. I don't even want to go there about that. But uh, I mean, there wasn't that much difference between the lesson on Mahatma Gandhi's assassination and Newton's laws. Uh, probably they were more cheerful than the one on, you know, cube roots and stuff like that. But uh, maybe, uh, but there wasn't that much difference. There was no, there was no emotional drama in the classroom from what I saw. And uh, the exam questions were uh, quite uh, pathetic, I must say, in this. I mean, I call it dust break Newtons because Newton's laws might as well have been commandments, you know, some bearded bloke on a mountain bringing the three laws on a tablet. The laws were mostly taught as unquestionable axioms. And uh, I mean, I was introduced as a logician. Logicians, you know, are particularly aware of the status of axioms and discuss them endlessly. The better classes provided everyday examples to illustrate the principle. They, there were many examples from everyday life. These were there. But these held the laws as truths and illustrated them. But that's what I would say. But even these were explanations, the truth of the laws were unquestioned. And, uh, you know, what were the questions, you know, the questions in general were mostly factual, mostly memory recall. In the case of Mahatma Gandhi's assassination was particularly depressing. I mean, there is one school which asked, uh, why did the UN flights flag at half mast on uh, January 19, January 31, 1948, you know, why would you care whether UN, you know, flew the flag at half mast or not, right? And another school actually gave a quote and said, who said this when? A light has gone out of our lives. And you get full marks if you say, Jawaharlal Nehru said this in the All India Radio broadcast after Gandhi died. Okay, so, I mean, there is not even perimacy like stuff about, you know, where Godse got his uh, gun from, what kind of gun. See, thing is, nobody actually went into the act and what happened, etc., etc. Right? There is no discussion at all. And like I said, this is one of the most poignant moments of young India's history. And it's taught, you know, routinely as if it were something else. Right? And the Newton's laws, yeah. So the questions that nobody asked, why are these called laws? And when I interacted with children, invariably I asked, what are laws? Some child says, you know, you can't escape it. You get punishment if you violated. I say, I want to violate Newton's third law. Please tell me what punishment I'll get. All children laugh, but then say, sir, you can't violate it. I said, but you said a law is something if you violate, you get punished. So, you know, these discussions almost never take place. Another question that is never raised is if they are true, how do you know them to be true? Right? And, uh, 
If they are false, what difference would it make for the world we live in? I mean, if Newton's laws did not hold, what would you expect to see in the world? I mean, I mean, Newton's laws may be even harder to think of, but Pascal's law, if there is a slight change, how would the world look? Right? I mean, these are questions almost never uh, looked at. This is actually one from a child in a science club mode. You know, he asked me, oh, what did people, actually he didn't put it in these terms, but this is what he meant. What if Newton's laws are so important, did people believe, did people believe that every action has an opposite, equal and opposite reaction before Newton or not? Beautiful question, really, right? How did people do mechanics before Newton? And actually, it would be a very interesting way of understanding Newton's laws if you could look at, you know, historically what kind of calculations people did earlier and what Newton brought to the table, right? But these kind of discussions never existed in the, any of these, right? And of course, how do I apply statements like these? to my experience in life. In this led to a series in Tamil Nadu Science Forum which we call Dialogues in Science. Because we realize that talking about science is something that simply not happens. And uh, you know, Balaji Sampath wrote a very nice book called The Case of the Sleeping Dog. Okay, so now the tragedy was not that uh, such rather philosophical questions were not asked in the classroom. I am not saying that. Right? But the point is there was very little discussion. I don't know the school that you went to and what your memory of school is, but I don't, I mean, I went, whatever I remembered from school was Newton's laws are something that you memorize and that's it, right? There is no argument originating from children's minds based on their concerns stated in their language. And this is a fundamental, if you talk to any educationist, you read educational literature, they talk at length only about this, that, you know, what originates from children's minds stated in their language is what, you know, goes deep in children's heads, right? So how is it that uh, science education misses out on this? What dominated the classroom was the language of the textbook. And the tyranny of the textbook permitted neither the teacher nor the students to approach the matter as something to be explored. Okay. <coughs> yeah, so there is a culture of silence, right? Now here is another uh, uh, classroom. So I asked, what is the boiling point of water? You know, again, a huge chorus, 100 degrees Celsius. And uh, then you ask, how do you know? Well, bit of a silence and uh, no, no experiment and all that. But, you know, what experiment? And some child always says, oh, I did the experiment. Then how do you do the experiment? Oh, I thermometer. And then quickly somebody points out that normal clinical thermometers would not do because their range is you know, nowhere near boiling point of water. You have to use a lab thermometer. Very few children have seen a lab thermometer. Only very few schools have access to a lab thermometer. But those schools, um, even in those schools, I don't know how many have, uh, I mean, I went to Vidya Mandir, they had a lab thermometer. But I found that uh, nobody had actually ever done that experiment using that thermometer. Because it is in a physics lab for a particular physics experiment, you know. It's not something that applies to anything that you learn in physics, right? So, but then, thanks to Tamil Nadu Science Forum, now I have done this many, many times in many groups of children, many teachers' workshops. And one of the nice things that you find that when you do it is that you never get 100, right? What is this 100 degrees Celsius? You get 100.2, maybe 98 point something, 101 point. You get all sorts of numbers, but getting 100 would be a real jackpot to me, right? You almost never get 100. And then you start asking, why is it that I never get 100? Right? Then all kinds of discussions happen. And I found this a very interesting discussion. You know, children talking, oh, that's because this is, uh, you know, metro water. Metro water doesn't boil at 100 degrees Celsius, right? Okay, this is very good. <laughs> and I think, okay, does it matter whether it's well water, tap waters? What about Bay of Bengal? You go and collect water, what would it be? What would be its boiling point? And so on. And then there is a lot of talk about dissolved impurities and so on. Okay, does it mean pure water boils at 100 degrees Celsius? What is pure water and so on? So this all, the, but the point is, science lives in those negotiations, right? It's very live science out there when you are discussing these things, right? Now, and then at some point you turn and ask, okay, this is all very good. But then what does the book mean when it says 100 degrees Celsius, right? Is the book lying or is the statement in the book to be read in some other way, right? Now, the notions that there are aggregate statements that we often make in science, 
right is very very important and it's never ever dealt with and discussed with uh, in school with either children or with teachers now the point is children rarely talk science and they rarely talk science in the classroom and i think these two are very important both are important and uh, children do not get many opportunities to do science outside the classroom especially at home i mean for me i think it was only in my undergraduate days i realized that whatever i had learnt in school was not science at all i mean i was very good at memorizing things and i even got a state rank in ssc but that was not science and then this business of talking in classrooms i learned only in graduate school right and i realized that you can actually you know talk in classrooms and go to the board and do things and so on right and uh, so these things were never part of uh, you know and actually trying out and you know when i went to tifr as a phd student i thought gods were working around right because it was so difficult to read books and understand theorems and these guys were all proving their own theorems right so they must be gods right the fact that you can do your own thing you can you, you know your own mathematics or science comes very very late in life for most of us right and uh, for, certainly for me and uh, rural children especially girls rarely see themselves as scientists and this is something that comes out very clearly so all this sounds very generic specific to any science classroom anywhere what i was talking about is newton's laws or boiling point but when you view from the lens of social equity the depth of the problem becomes really visible because the indian science scene is characterized by social exclusion right and everywhere across the board you see that and uh, but whereas science education school science education you know education is a fundamental right guaranteed by the constitution today right quality science education is the right of every child when you look at it from quality mathematics education is the right of every child when you look at it from that perspective and we are not talking about you know philosophical discussions in science classrooms now about then what happens in the process of what is happening in the classroom and what it does to the alienation of children <clears throat> so it's dominated by the urban elite from socially and economically privileged sections science education as all of school does reflects the structures of social inequity so here is an example and this i think to many of my friends this will be very familiar because i always take the example of kuruma who taught me so much right and uh, so tnsf organizes these so called meet the scientist sessions and i have participated in many of them and this one was long ago in a village in arupkote so you know i landed in the evening I, like i used to do in many of these places in the village and at night typically you have you have a telescope look at the sky there is a sky show and then you walk around at 8 o'clock you have the sky show talk to children go to sleep leave early morning this is the sort of thing so in the evening i am going around and uh, my 12 year old guide in chief kuruma and uh, she is a dalit girl child of agricultural laborers first generation learners we walk around she tells me shows me trees plants medicinal herbs birds insects she knows about all this and keeps chattering all the time i don't know most of these things i don't know how many <coughs> names of trees you know in tamil how many birds you know in tamil and so on again through science forum now i've learned a lot but i was a good town boy who grew up in trichy and i knew a few but not very many and this girl was rattling off many and you know and i kept on saying that i don't know i don't know and she was amazed i'm the scientist right so <clears throat> so she knew a lot about uh, jaggery you know there is a place in the village where they were making molasses she knew about that could identify constellations in the night sky so and uh, very chatty child and she had so much to say so next morning i was leaving all the children came to say bye and i say kuruma you will make a great scientist some day and of course all the children laughed sir i never get more than 30 marks in science right now this is the reality right now of course what's the probability that kuruma would become a scientist one day enter the portals of icer or i iit or iisc or math science or tifr or whatever right now i have done that exercise many many times i don't want to go through that also now is you know invariably people say the probability is very very small single digit is what i get i remember in iisc auditorium in that great uh, auditorium i had this thing and i was asking you know what do you and i was uh, you know almost everybody said single digit 
right now the thing is that okay that means it's not even like we don't know we know very well right there seems to be almost a consensus among the scientific community that kuruma probability of kuruma entering the portals of science is single digit very you know close to zero so we know we know the problem we know what it is so what is going on i think that is really my question right now there is a the advent of mass education and western models of science education in this country was accompanied by an enlightenment mood if you read zakir husain committee in the 1930s 1936 when bose was president of the congress the science committee was formed under the chairmanship of uh, jawarlal nehru with three sub committees shanti swarup bhatnagar as one of the three chairman you know there was a mood at the time of that country is you know is you know part of nationalist talk was this idea that science is a means of liberation from casteist and religious domination of social practices and people wrote about it all gandhi kumarappa uh, report which is very very different in flavor in 1936 naitalin even that talks about science as a way of breaking down the major caste barriers of the country right so science is a very important weapon in the battle against forces of obscurantism and superstition this is nehru science education as an essential component of modernization and social transformation and this is something nehru kept on writing about in the 19 late 1930s and 1940 in fact i don't know how many people know that 47 august india got independence and it was a bloody time with you know the great wars of partition with all that Jawaharlal Nehru signed a science policy statement on you know August 18th okay within a day he signed a statement on the science policy so it was considered something very important for the country but science education largely reflects social inequity looking at it today in terms of academic performance which is the passport to economic upliftment kuruma has no hope of becoming a scientist in terms of processes that encourage critical thought that lead her towards freedom from fear and prejudice school science seems to be of little help there are very important systemic issues her identity as a rural dalit girl as a first generation learner there are no books no gadgets at home her school has no library nor laboratory and this is a you know reality for a very large percentage of schools even today and the idioms of modern urban science are alien to her there are no planetaria no science city no internet the state supplied textbook is her sole link to formal science and experiments are at best seen from a distance once in a few weeks and it was non existent i remember in my school i remember experiments were always done by our science teacher and we all used to you know crowd and look basically you could look and not touch and uh, you know but you could see right this is the sort of things that but anyway did any but i could watch our teacher do some science experiments and they, there was one cupboard where things would be locked up and uh, now whatever she knows is not acknowledged and i think this is very important her extensive familiarity with the world around her her hands on experience with processes her ability to make things grow to shape things to connect to nature you know none of this so one thing she learns whatever you go whatever you learn in school right whatever she knows is not science right whatever it might be and school another thing is about technology right school typically teaches her to look at technology as something given not as constructed and i think this is very important so but then it's very important that she needs modern science right i'm not romanticizing her knowledge right she needs to travel beyond experiential learning she can make things grow but she doesn't know nitrogen fixation right she doesn't know many many things she needs she needs even more the language of science which insists on quantification that language is completely outside her realm of experience talk thought any of that right measurement right the notion of measurement the notion of accuracy estimation approximation and and these things which we take for granted when we talk science right and uh, the fact that you talk about linear variation or other variation plot graphs right equations that's a world completely alien to her so when kuruma cannot speak this language entry in, into the world of science is denied her as in other forms language is a powerful means of social exclusion and when she cannot speak the language of mathematics and science 
she is out of it. And of course, there is a political dimension in the last uh, few decades, right? There is this aggressiveness of this nationalist sentiment, which has had a major impact. There is a systematic attempt to reject Western science and to talk about Indian roots in science. Now, science education has become yet another arena for building nationalist fervor of a very narrow kind. And, you know, I want to contrast this with the nationalist fervor that I was talking about from the 1930s and 40s, because that entire language was of nationalist, uh, rose from nationalist documents, but it saw science as a way of nation building and uh, as a way of solving very important social problems of the country. So, science education then gets increasingly more and more alienated from the scientific temper. So, what are the central issues of concern then, right? One is, there is almost little experimentation and critical thinking in uh, processes of school science. Little relation to technology, right? And, uh, I mean, children learn Pascal's law, Bernoulli principle, all these things, right? And then, uh, but then you ask, you know, what is it that holds up these trucks? Right, these large trucks, right? Okay, tires. Oh, but what is there in the tire? Air. How does air hold all this? Right. So the point is that you don't quite correlate all this formal stuff that you learn with the potential that it has for technology. Right. That's what I mean. So science education really has very little relation to technology, and of course reliance on rote learning that we all know, and very importantly, inadequate teacher preparation. It's assumed that teachers know this science, teachers know this mathematics, but is it a matter of knowledge in that sense? This way of looking at uh, science and mathematics from a child's point of view and arguing science is very, very hard for school teachers, for anybody really. So if we want to talk about, we want to think about crucial changes needed in school science, somewhere the shifting, there is need, we need to shift focus. We need to shift focus of the science classroom from content knowledge towards critical scientific inquiry. Active engagement of all children in experimentation and working with wood, metal and soil using material to build things. I think this is very important. The materialistic nature of scientific explanations is something that uh, is taken for granted but needs to be explicitly emphasized in school for children to get a feel for what science is actually about. That touching material is very important, handling material is very important, fluency with material is very important, right? And I think, uh, of course, you know, we are talking about this in an institute, uh, which is a mathematical institute, and uh, but the but we are very clear what science is actually about, right? And if you want to look at scientific temper and critical thinking, which uh, NEP 2020 talks about, but mentions and has no relation. I mean, if you look at the rest of the stuff, it's very hard to see what they're really talking about at all. But how can we have critical thinking, critical scientific inquiry without emphasizing the materialistic basis of science? And I must say that word experimentation is almost doesn't exist in school or even undergraduate curricula because, uh, you know, experiments as they are done are experiments that are laid down in gold. Right? Like Newton's laws. Everything is told to you, you perform the experiment, you are told what kind of results you should get and your job is to replicate and produce that. That training is important. I am not saying no. It's very important to be able to replicate and produce the results. I am not denying that at all. But that cannot be all that is to experiments. Right? And that's the point I am making here. I mean, I remember in my undergraduate days in Bichpilani, and I mean, I did... Uh, I got an engineering degree, which meant that you had long three-hour labs and, you know, and one thing was very clear that what is the objective of going to the lab? You know that, you know, before you go, you find out what data you should be getting and you spend your three years desperately producing that. After a little bit of maturity, you realize that numbers don't matter, the shape of the graph matters, right? So you work very hard to produce that shape of the graph, right? Nothing to do with trying something, nothing to do with approaching something where you don't know the answers. Try out something. Of course, research is all about that. I mean, as I said, I learned it much, much later in life that that's what it is all about. Approaching something where you don't know the answer and try out, fail miserably, <laughs> try out several times and eventually get somewhere. 
right make progress right this is the kind of things that we talk about in research but experimentation the notion of experimentation is about all that and our children never get a taste of any of that at all right and but that i think active engagement in some experimentation like i told you about boiling point of water right i have done you know experiments with children where we have done projects where you find the boiling point of sambar I mean, boiling sambar has boiling point right and finding the boiling point of sambar is amusing exciting interesting for children and then when you ask you know if i increase the concentration of uh, uh, what is puli imli imli in sambar does the boiling point go up or come down of course every child makes a conjecture and then you actually try it and see and then you once you look at how it varies you ask what kind of variation is it can you plot a graph can you you know come up with an equation for doing that that is experimentation right where children are approaching something without actually knowing what the answer is going to be and try out and the amount of what they learn about the process of science the messy science out there you know the worst thing about school experiments are those records you know we say mutmuta manimaniya in tamil you know you they written so beautifully those records are written so in such a lovely and uh, thanks to some of my friends i got logs from some of the scientists and you know data logs from some of the scientists and you show children they are so dirty they are so crumpled probably with sambar on them all sorts of stuff on them but they are real data collected by real science real you know science is not science is very messy it's horrible it's not like you know this kind of beautiful records that you do right and uh, but for children to even see that that's what it's about is very very different yeah okay and like i said working with material making connections between the areas of science as well as uh, and this is another very important problem right one of one children one child taught me very beautifully um, she was preparing for uh, class 10 exams and we were doing something and uh, she said uncle if sin theta comes in mathematics it is the ratio of opposite side to i mean uh, hypotenuse if it comes in science it's a wave right very nice in science it's never a triangle where you have to look at opposite hypotenuse side but you should know the wave in mathematics it should be the ratio right so i mean there are no connections at all right and uh, children learn quadratic equations right and all kinds of quadratic equations but m1 m2 by r square never is not a quadratic it's not a quadratic equation right come on quadratic equation is x square plus b plus c equal to 0 right so g m1 m2 by r square doesn't sound very quadratic right and so on so yeah i mean uh, there is a i mean i shouldn't uh, put it that way either but yeah anyway uh, and the other is changing assessment models to reflect method i mean i think this we are in the you know we are not even there is not even a dawn in sight i must say right i mean process assessment as a rule is something that uh, we know nothing about and enriching teachers and this is i think probably the most important thing right providing a variety of resources for teachers i think uh, that probably is what will make all the difference now uh, i am not going to go much further i don't know i thought i'll mention um maybe problem centered learning in mathematics on which a lot is happening all around the world and we don't our math education we don't have too much of these integrated learning modules i might say something about this now let me come to mathematics right now the practice of mathematics right doing mathematics for us means many things right selecting between representations devising representations looking for invariances right and observing extreme cases and typical ones to come up with conjectures looking actively for counter examples i mean this is a major secret that is kept that uh, you know in mathematics you actually look for counter examples and uh, simply and this is something unique to mathematics you simplify a problem by generalizing it making it easier to address right building on answers to generate new questions for exploration and so on and that is very you know integral to the process of doing mathematics but almost all of these are mostly missing in school mathematics is a finished thing you know every question has a very precise answer either you know it or not and that is the end of the whole thing right when you solve the problem <coughs> now here is a project that i wanted to mention to at least give an idea of what i meant by this uh, project based problem based learning and so on this was uh, uh, in sboa school after the big flood that we had in uh, 
um, December 2015, I think, right? And uh, so this was a, you know, if you have to design an emergency shelter, build a tent, basically after a natural disaster, how would you design a tent? And, uh, you know, and this is a very interesting project. This is class 11 children. And there were all kinds of questions there. How much height is needed for sleeping, for lying flat on your side? Now, if it's a tent that you use only for, you know, going to sleep, you don't, you're not going to, you know, stand up and do things. So, you, you know, so how much uh, floor space can you actually use? How much will be wasted? What's a reasonable height at the center? Right. And if you, you know, probably don't want to get up and do things, but you at least need to sit up. What should be the angle of the walls to achieve the height needed over much of the tent? Now, do you want a tent to fit the average person? But what's an average person? How do I even find out what the dimensions of an average person are? Right? Very important for children. <laughs> what scale do you use for the diagrams and the plan? Right? So there are all sorts of things that came up in the discussion. And uh, actually, this is a very, very nice project that children did. And um, now, the point is that when they did something like that, a whole range of curricular areas intersected. Handling data, finding, um, you know, a whole lot of data had to be found. Geometry and measures, 3D shapes, 2D representations, nets and construction, angles, scale drawing and measurement, finding lengths and areas to determine the materials required, quantities of fabric needed, lengths of poles, and of course, trigonometry. So, and there is also economics and optimization because you know the idea was that you want to do it at as low cost as possible because the school was actually going to finally do it, right? I mean, they're going to give the order. They actually did it. SBOA school and Ananagar actually did it. And so there was a lot of uh, very, very interesting discussions that took place. And the children actually did a very good work of it. They used dynamic, you know, GeoGebra for uh, the exploration. They used internet extensively for information. So the point is that. <coughs> There are ways of approaching problems where you can actually give the experience of, you know, some actual problem to be solved and bring in various curricular areas. And then when they work in groups and together, children show a lot of excitement and a willingness to learn. Now, oh, okay, let me, I really don't want to get it. I have a whole lot of problems and things to do. So the main idea in these is that, you know, children are confronted with the problem to solve. Typically, there is some looseness to the problem description and then they invariably ask, what do we know and what do we need to know and how do I access information, how do I understand it. So this is all part of uh, what we call low threshold, high ceiling explorations, right. So I don't want to go into lots of examples, maybe if you want to uh, discuss, I can mention many such. I, I wanted to just shift track and talk about because the problems that I'm talking about, not specific to science or mathematics or whatever. I mean, it's all the same finally for children, right? And uh, there are many similar projects in science as well. Uh, let me mention integrated modules. Now, one of the things that we were trying to do in Science Forum was to somehow break the kind of compartmentalization that's also happening. So the idea was to develop modules where you take up some theme but go across, uh, you know, different uh, disciplines as far as children are concerned. You know, you take a theme like light, that is, you can explore it from, of course, from physics, but there is also art and photography, and children can do very interesting projects. Kitchen, I mean, I think one of the most, in fact, from whatever I have written, the bestseller that I can say is one book called Samayla Rail Vinyanam, which is, uh, you know, science in the kitchen and that's something that uh, children really enjoy enormously. In science festivals, we usually have a group of 20-25 children sit around. We have usually something to cook on. You make a dish basically together. But during that, you have lots of questions, right? What is needed for doing this? I mean, even rice, right? When you start making, children will usually say heat, okay? Then you apply heat and say that it only burns, right? It becomes black. Another question there, why does it turn black? Right, not blue or whatever. Right, another. So, and then somebody says you, you know, you need hot water. Okay, you pour hot water, it doesn't become, you know, rice doesn't cook. Somebody says steam. Why is steam needed? What is the process of cooking? You are doing all that, right? And then you are, you know, estimating. You are budgeting. There's a lot of activity that happens, and you also have discussion on who is doing the cooking at home, right? So, right, you do an entire thing. Who is cooking? How much in your house? 
right you discuss all that why is it that women are cooking right ah so no no only women should cook sir i mean children naturally say such things right it's not a, and all this comes up right and uh, what are the dimensions of the kitchen in your house right how much waking time is actually spent in the kitchen how much lighting and ventilation does your kitchen have so all sorts of very interesting things so so it's the point is to look at phenomena look at activity look at doing things and have a range of what i said right in the beginning talking science talking mathematics and doing something right of course at the end of it you get something to eat right you make kesari or something like that everyone has something nice to eat at the end right so that's also part of the fun but uh, and then kitchen is a great place for engineering processes there is milling and grinding and all sorts of things that's happening there right and uh, beach i mean we have had great times with the children from besant besant theosophical school and you know anna school and so on going to the beach i mean they are all from uh, besanagar and tiruvannur and places like that right but to go and explore the beach right look at mean time mean height you know mean height of waves mean time between waves calculating these things is wonderful why are boats shaped in a particular way what is the thing you know catamarans you go and talk to fishermen right and of course uh, you collect a whole lot of shells and things you look at fishing nets you talk to women and find out about how they sell fish and what they earn and what's the economics at different months of the year and then fisher folk's lives stories songs that are, fisher folk have all kinds of very interesting songs all tamilians know because uh, tamil films have popularized a few songs but actually there are like host of songs and how they tell constellations when they go at night and how they navigate by constellations at night there's a lot to learn for children right but these are not compartmentalized this is not science this is not but in the process you get a world view you get to look at science and society and many of the processes at the time that i mentioned in the beginning you know are brought in in a very live way for children and uh, yeah so this is something that came up out of the flood okay like that okay here is a i don't know if you can see a uh, math science logo is right at the bottom okay so there is mathematicum of giessen and uh, germany and imsc so this was a an exhibition that uh, geta institute organized in 2013 called mathematics you can touch i mean and this is a wonderful thing that uh, you know some of us are also part of and we it is a range of you know children for children to explore it's all math and you of course you can see the soap uh, film there right but uh, there were many many things that children could do i mean the idea was that it some you learn mathematics by actually doing something out there right and it is a fascinating exercise uh, i just wanted to mention these kind of exhibitions the importance of of these exhibitions right and traveling exhibitions and uh, the world has many many such i mean let me mention the mathematita of milano one of the great ones the any number of science museums in the world Uh, Gazen, the one Mathematicum I mentioned. Uh, New York museums collaborations with schools. This is something fascinating that they do. So it's actually possible to, you know, have many of these models on display, show things, and so on. Right. So, okay. Does any of this better Kuroma's prospect of becoming a scientist? Right. But main point is that ch changing our classrooms into exploratory centers offers far more space for children like Kuroma. much of science education today does not address technology and its nature that i mentioned right so new models in schools that emphasize processes group learning and open ended exploration have greater hope of success with children in this century whatever socio economic background they are from now this is all not easy because school is at the bottom of this whole pyramid right schools have to prepare students for future study and uh, employment and their focus is on recall fluency accuracy and ways of working there are limited time slots curricular pressures assessment regimes and of course educational authority and teachers right our underpaid underprepared and supported teachers right there i think the biggest systemic difficulty is in teachers understanding of process in science and mathematics education and the lack of systemic means to provide it and uh, felix klein talks about mathematics teachers suffering from a double discontinuity basically you learn mathematics in school you go to university and you realize you know you completely it's a completely different discipline and you learn university mathematics you become a teacher come back to school and you are back to this 
right? And it's very hard for many, even very sincere teachers to negotiate. And uh, they have themselves not understood the concept successfully and they have never introspected on these, right? So the point is that we would like teachers who actually do some science and mathematics over time, themselves do some, have some experience of doing science and mathematics, exploring questions which have uh, intellectual purpose because they want to know, right? Not just what they want to teach in their classroom. So who is to do this? Maybe I should uh, skip all this polemics and go ahead, right? Okay. At last, I have come to this, right? Scientists rarely get an opportunity to enter the world of school children, right? Scientists rarely get an opportunity to observe structures of inequity in the system, the kind of thing that I am talking about for Kuruvamma. How often do we get a chance to even interact with the Kuruvammas of the world? Now, we do conduct open days, right? But participation tends to be from elite, urban elite sections, except like, you know, we do Ganidakanagam and so on when corporation school children come. But in general, this is not who you interact with. The exciting world of scientific research remains largely alien to the bulk of university teachers and students as well. Right? So the compartmentalization in our this thing is very strong. Higher secondary teachers have never stepped into a primary school classroom. University professors have never stepped into a school classroom at all. Scientists have very rarely stepped into any of these classrooms ever. Right, and that is the norm. And uh, so, question is, of course, education is not the mandate of research scientists. How can a research laboratory contribute to school education? Should a research laboratory contribute to education? Right, I think it's a very reasonable question to ask. How much effort should we be putting into this? It's not our job, right? And I've, these, you know, these are discussions that we have had many times. Now, the point is not to. I think if you start thinking about how one can, I think you see the possibilities. One is intervention in the framing of curriculum and syllabus. And this I think one should view with some caution. Because scientists can't take over and start writing textbooks or this thing. One should not either. But on the other hand, the involvement of scientists, the involvement of researchers can bring in certain quality, certain uh, ways of thought that are very important. So the point is for Collaborating in the process, not taking over. I think it's it's impossible for scientists to, and one scientist should not, right? Guidance in teacher education. I think you know one of the worst things about the country is its attitude to teacher education. BEDs, you know, I mean, I shudder to even mention what happens in BEDs, right? But teacher education is extremely important. If we, you know, especially teachers' understanding of mathematics and science, math pedagogy or science pedagogy. There, I think providing guidance is what I will use. I use that word guidance here, not mentorship for teachers and students. And I think this is something that we can do a lot more of. And uh, beyond the textbook materials and textbook reviews, and textbook reviews are very important because textbooks need to be reviewed by many, many different sections of society. School teachers need to review them. College professors need to review them. Scientists need to review them. Parents need to review them. And the point is that you all bring in, everybody brings in a different view. And all that is very important and relevant. Because I remember once again, the state supplied textbook is the sole source of knowledge for crores of children in the country. Right? For very, very few are there other sources of knowledge. Right? So state supplied textbooks are extremely important, but we very rarely engage with them and review them. Right? One of, I remember one eminent historian was uh, looking at, uh, the class 11 textbook and she was appalled mightily for Raman at the time when she was, you know, and I was showing her the book. It says bombs were dropped on Hiroshima on August 6th. I mean, what do you mean bombs were dropped on Hiroshima? Did they fall from heaven? <laughs> right? Why is even a sentence like, does the sentence actually make sense? Right? So, history is somewhere else. I mean, I, I'm just mentioning science books here. Right? Looking at textbooks, Everybody brings a certain eye and I think this is very important. There's a lot we can do in this. And of course, innovation at uh, senior secondary and undergraduate levels. This is a felt need in the country. And in fact, education research, there's a lot happening on elementary education in the country. When you look at education research, very little on higher secondary and uh, certainly very little on undergraduate education, right? And uh, research centers as platforms for science communication, right? Communicate the relevance and excitement of research in our field to the general public. Attracting young talent to the basic sciences. Uh, this is again a felt need in the country. All over, everybody talks about the need for that. And so systematically asking what can we do for it? 
how much do we do for it right becomes a very important thing institutionally use of new technologies to reach out to the young right i mean there are now all kinds of technologies available and a conscious and systematic attempt to engage with st students and the educated public right so the point i'm making is that uh, all this is uh, ways by which scientists by simply becoming aware of the problem addressing the depth of the problem communicating to educators that the problem is not about memory not about range of knowledge not about uh, extensive knowledge but processes right that shift from content to process if this as a demand comes from scientists that that's what is important mathematicians have again and again spoken in, across the world in many many different contexts that school mathematics need not have all kinds of stuff right what is much more important <coughs> is conceptual clarity and i said, mentioned many of the processes processes such as visualization abstraction representation many of these are much more important than knowing formulas and things right but these calls coming and uh, making it clear that the goals of science education are best served when there is talk when children talk science talk mathematics right and i think this is something that we can communicate to the uh, public at large so let me end with a quote from william thurston uh, you know a great mathematician who has written a lot about mathematics education right so he says i am optimistic i think 1990 and he is talking about the us right i am optimistic that our nation will find solutions to these problems problems arising from failure of understanding are curable we do not lack for dedication resources or intelligence we lack direction and then he goes on to say the needed reforms will take place not through governmental action but through collegial cooperative efforts at the end he says as we all turn more of our attention to education good educational ideas will also spread rapidly thank you questions from the audience no. Mike. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. Um, so, yeah, uh, being parent of a high school son, I looked at the NCRT textbooks in maths and science quite a bit, as well as textbooks from uh, various foreign publishers, Cambridge and Oxford, and so on. NCRT books are actually, in you know, in terms of what they contain, they are not bad at all. And yeah. every science and you know chapters. You know, every couple of pages is an activity that you're supposed to do at home and record the results. And in maths, they have a lot of emphasis on probability statistics, data science, which was, I think, not there at all in our time. Uh, so uh, I think what uh, you're talking about is implementation, that how do teachers make it? And of course, in the last two years, uh, everything is online and it's much harder to do, have even normal interactions in class. Um, I am just uh, not. Uh, I, I realize this is a kind of privileged kid, privileged school and all, but it's um, not as terrible uh, in terms of general approach as it came across. Uh, what we need is to empower teachers at all uh, levels, all kinds of schools to be able to um, do what the book is actually asking them to do. Maybe. And um, of course, there's room for improvement on all sides, but uh, I, I, that's kind of how I felt about it. Yeah. I, I, okay. So I, I must say that. Sorry if I painted a doomsday picture, which I that is not the intention. The I mean, see, even with the NCRT books, I want to say something on this. I mean, I was very much involved in the national curriculum framework effort and the set of textbooks that came and the kind of negotiations that go on. Um, NCRT textbooks also finally there is a lot of compromise of many of these things finally something happens I mean for instance in mathematics textbooks I remember mathematical modeling was a very important uh, part of uh, <coughs> uh, secondary higher secondary curriculum it was put in but then CBSC said oh but we have a problem you know assessment projects all sorts of things finally backed out Ma mathematical modeling went into the appendix and you know what happens if it goes to the appendix right I mean that's a clear signal that there will be no exams and you know schools simply mod out of that whole exercise right so this I and mean, this is ncrt 
and remember that cbsc schools are minuscule in the country right now, what i was talking about was this huge population out there and uh, there are 43 boards in the country right 43 boards of education and every board has its own textbook and uh, tamil nadu textbook again you know i know the kind of thing that happens there now uh, the textbooks are a very varying quality i agree that uh, there is a big movement forward from what the earlier ones used to be and there is um, again the difference between uh, mathematics books and science books and history books and all that, that i was talking about that's a big uh, topic in itself but uh, the if for uh, um, many children where as i said the school is the own, you know the school textbook is the only source of knowledge right invariably all those corresponding activities that are that surrounding activities that are provided unless there is some support at home right somebody you know who is encouraging and there is a way by which these children can actually take up some activities the probability that they will actually get to do these activities is close to zero for most children that's all for most children the textbook is something and especially from uh, poorer sections textbook is something that uh, is associated with the classroom and whatever is demanded in the classroom you provide and that's it i think you go i mean all the rest of it that is talked about maybe for explanation you might read it but hands on is almost uh, very very rare that's the and even among urban elite schools the percentage of children who actually do hands on experiments and work is actually very small as it turns out in almost all studies that is the situation basically because it's not prioritized right and mainly because it's not assessed this is the problem it comes down to that again and again yeah, yeah. thank you Jara, for this wonderful presentation <clears throat> you mentioned uh, several things about construction of knowledge which we can i can find close to what national education policy 2020 mentions that uh, discourages the knowledge as something externally given so i think being a researcher in science or mathematics we also construct knowledge yeah. and it can help us when we are teaching in classrooms it we can help students create construct knowledge so that's really great so my i have uh, i'm wondering about two things uh, which is uh, i would like to your response on that first thing is that in in our country there are many uh, excellent researchers which are going to <coughs> mathematics departments and we have like we have several uh, professional development programs like for instance ugc small cell uh, orientation refresher courses in which we teach teachers uh, topics so that they can get refreshed so i am wondering about uh, like is there any need uh, of like continuous capacity building in terms of pedagogy for university mathematics teachers do we have any such programs in our country which focuses not only on the topics but on yeah. how to on teach pedagogy. those topics yeah, and second quick <coughs> question is like uh, we we can find abroad a lot of mathematics departments which have faculty members who are mathematics educators uh, to my limited knowledge i don't find that thing in our country what do you see uh, in that yeah. respect okay yeah i think it's uh, I know you know all about constructivism and you know you know the my stand on these things as well for many years uh, so i mean of course i am talking about from a constructivist uh, paradigm that's clear but uh, if you ask about constructivist pedagogy or you know that getting into teacher education teacher preparation right i mean the ncrt textbooks from 2005 onwards at least try to bring in constructivist pedagogy that's how the whole textbook rewriting happened now we'll see, you know, a new national curriculum framework is coming, new curricula are coming, I don't know how this is all going to pan out in the coming years, but that is the thing. The problem is that uh, in terms of pedagogy, uh, teacher preparation, we are very, very far away, right? The roadmap that the national curriculum framework 2005 came up with and the sort of things that you are talking about remains largely on paper, right? Um, Textbook changes are only a very small part of it. Teacher preparation is a huge part of it, and on that we are not yet. And when it comes to undergraduate pedagogy, I think uh, you know we are not touching those issues at all. 
broadly speaking in the country because uh, as far as uh, if once you have a master's degree right once you have a master's degree you can teach an undergraduate class you can teach a higher secondary class uh, now for promotion to assistant professor you need a phd that is the rule that you see is brought but basically that's it right there is no notion of pedagogy at all that comes in at that point you need not have looked at any pedagogy anywhere you just go and teach right so the need for discussions on pedagogy at undergraduate level is something people are talking about but i do not see any kind of uh, systemic structures in place for that and uh, nep does talk about uh, one very important thing that uh, bring in education as one aspect of every disciplinary department in universities i mean i think if that vision it's a bit it's very confused and ambiguous in the way policy talks about we'll see how it proceeds if for instance it's going to be the case that every university will have let's say mathematics physics chemistry whatever but also uh, education with somebody involved in mathematics education somebody involved in physics education chemistry education etc i don't know how this vision is to be realized but if that becomes the norm yes i think all this is likely to pan out but integrating uh, disciplinary education with pedagogy is something that uh, there are universities which uh, in the world and utrecht and the fraudenthal institute have done a remarkable job in netherlands of doing that university of waterloo has a very interesting program cambridge has a very interesting program there are a few universities in the world which seem to be you know working very hard on these and uh, have but they all have I, mean, i must say that these are universities with very strong mathematics groups very strong education groups which are coming together right and to work together and do that's actually the natural way it will happen but uh, i don't know of national initiatives anywhere in the world for integrating disciplinary education and pedagogy at university level that's it okay. thank you very much i am a parent of a school teacher so i watch her every day preparing for for school uh, you know lectures and other things one thing i notice is that uh, the teachers are very stressed so obviously there needs to be some big changes in the framework curriculum framework especially if you want to bring in those modules that you talked about yes which requires one lot of time in the class if are interacting with students and also a lot of interaction between teachers teaching various subjects yeah now the point is that you have a national education policy and curriculum framework at least some of the things which you put us in touch with when shankar and i were going through we wrote a report on that i don't think the class 11 and 12 curriculum could have been covered even in one and a half uh, years in 11th or one and a half years in 12th it's too huge something like 120 to 140 lectures were needed and that wouldn't be available yeah. now what is the fate of teachers who have to do this also okay. as well as do these modules and uh, have this interactive thing where they can go out and uh, it, it's a great idea but unless there is a fundamental change in the way we look at education all the suggestions that you have made however you know valid and uh, beautiful they are in the present setup it cannot be done so um, i completely agree and i think you know teachers are uh, that's why i said uh, our uh, underpaid under supported and uh, you know so uh, my sympathy is entirely with teachers i've been working with school teachers you know pretty much all my life on this and my sympathy is entirely with them and i agree with you the point i am making is that it's true systemic changes are needed and but even before i mean like uh, praveen is talking about also you need large scale systemic changes i am aware of that but even to enable large scale systemic changes we need to multiply the amount of resources you know if you ask me in all this what's priority i would say resources 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 educational resources even designing those modules right if you put out a lot right people will pick up right our teachers also there is a gaussian curve right i mean there are some teachers who you know whatever you do whatever you provide whatever systemic change you make it will be very hard to i'm not talking about that 
and there are some teachers under tremendous adversity i know who are doing highly innovative work and are doing all sorts of things right but we are not talking about them we are talking about shifting the mean right for doing that we need to provide an enormous amount of educational resource but that's that was where i was coming in to say that in providing resources in designing resources in showing the way i think you know a lot more contribution can come from various sections of society especially scientists the community of scientists right i agree systemic changes are definitely needed but today even if the government waves a magic wand and say we'll put all these structures in place it's not clear to me that we have the resources right these kind of modules that i'm talking about assess process assessment like i talked about right various things we don't have so for teacher education to be taken you know seriously i think we have not taken teacher education seriously at all in the country and by teacher education i don't mean the degree but teacher support providing resources for teachers educational resources apart from financial and other and teacher autonomy maybe you know you take it for granted in uh, kaveri's case but teacher autonomy is a huge issue for most teachers right teachers do not have autonomy to even decide what they do in their classroom on a particular day so teacher autonomy is extremely important we need to trust the teachers we need to empower the teachers right but for that we must begin with a, you know huge amount of resources in mathematics and science i'm only talking about mathematics and science what i'm saying is generic across but especially in mathematics and science i think we need to generate a lot more resources than what we have done and that at a national level i think is certainly possible because we do like thurston says right we do have people we do have the talent we do have the wherewithal we need some direction on that now it's not clear to me that by providing resources the systemic changes will happen that's a separate thing that needs to be done but my point is that without resources whatever systemic action will not help whereas in the west in many countries that i see it's by you know scandinavian countries are especially good at that the amount of resource, educational resources that they work on and generate at all levels right so that eases the teachers job considerably that's all i can say yeah you yeah. know that's a big to- i completely agree i am saying that's a huge problem but even without that i'm saying that, yeah i agree no but that comes from a different social pressure right it's about upward mobility the great uh, performance pressure performance and public exams and competitive exams Yeah, yeah. So uh, great talk as always. So you know, over the last couple of years, like most parents, I've been embedded in a primary classroom. So uh, you know, many of the things that you know people already spoke about, like Rahul spoke about, like some of the content actually I thought was great. Yeah. But you know, got vitiated by the pressures of the classroom. Yeah. So for example, you know, like last, just a few weeks back, you know, they were learning about light, shadow, and so on. And so the book basically says, you know, take a torch light, take you know some yeah, plant. Yeah. go to a wall try right. all these experiments but because of pressures of time teacher was saying no 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 don't need to do it just just learn these things and we'll just do a quiz so that we quickly learn all this yeah now of course teachers differ but i could also see where the pressure is coming from because in the whatsapp group of the parents there's a lot of chat going on you know what is this if why is this teacher not completing the syllabus how are my children going to cope up with iit exams i mean this we are talking about class 3 and 4 children right <laughs> so so i realized that the big issue is the parental you know like push that you know all this is useless will they be doing good in iit medical entrance exam and for them the career of a scientist is like they don't even know what a scientist is for them anything other than an engineer or a doctor is a loser okay and uh, someone even from iit or something they just pigeon hold them as a teacher or oh, teacher huh? i mean like that's considered to be like you didn't You you lost out in the game of life, so I see that you know like we are going to do any of this to prevent it getting lost in parental pushback. We have to you know also change the perception of a large section of population for whom being a scientist is just a being a loser. Yeah. Right? No. I okay. So again, this comes down to the same issue. Uh, so by the way, the Mathematic series uh, for elementary education that NCERT came up with, I still feel are very very good. Right. but you know i was part of this kind of work so i you know i'm taking a step back but the problem is that almost all of this assumes a structure where there is openness for activity openness for exploration my whereas that i'm saying is a no no for a large part of the country i was looking at it from that perspective 
Now, in terms of uh, the exam pressure and in terms of the, you know, parent group pressure, right? Now, it's a sad fact of the country that even these pressures are, you know, uh, applied only on very small section of the population, right? For the Kurumas of the world, there are no parent uh, groups, you know, PTA meetings, nobody is there, right? There are no parents putting any pressure on the system. For a large section of students studying in government schools, right, for first generation learners, all this, there are no parental pressures, right? It's true. I mean, I agree that all this is a problem in the country. I was only talking about it from a particular lens, right, viewing it from a social equity lens. And I was making certain points. But it's true that the tremendous pressures caused by, I mean, see, the shadow of the board exam looms so large. He was talking about the entrance exam. I am waiting for the day where, uh, you know, you will have ads showing how, you know, you play this particular thing when the child is in the womb, right? You play this particular song and JE is assured, right? So, all this will come, right? So, we have beautiful and EdTech is showing the way how we will be able to do all of this, right? But that is because of the tremendous pressure, right? Remember in, in societies where I mean, this national exams are a huge problem in Asia. I mean, today it's a problem of Asia. If we talk about this as a problem of India, we have to see China. I mean, China is the pressure is like 10 times much worse from whatever I have seen in China. My God, right? It's a, it's a horrible situation in Indonesia, India, China, all these places because unlike many other parts of the world where, you know, I mean, if you look at Europeans, Americans, whatever, right? Whatever degree you get, you can earn a life of dignity, right? Right to education is finally about right to dignity, right to a life of dignity. Look at it that way, right? The point is that if I can be sure that if education is the only passport that ensures what I consider a life of dignity, right? And that becomes the defining point for everything. Right? And that becomes, in fact, and let's be clear about it. For urban educated middle class sections, that is the norm. Right? And therefore, curricular board, social, you know, syllabus board, they are all under pressure. Right? As long as JEE is there, look, I have participated in curricular discussions. I have sat on curriculum committees for, I don't know, 96 was the first time. Right? So, this is 25 years I have been on committees. Right? In primary education, we can bring in a lot of change. Middle school, we can do something. By the time we come to secondary and higher secondary, the rigidity in the system is remarkable. It's a, it's a huge brick wall out there. You can't touch it, right? One IS officer very clearly said, don't touch it, <laughs> right? This is a brand value. IITs are a brand value for us, right? And you don't come up with all your philosophy and gan and do anything. You do whatever you want in primary and this thing. That is why, you know, those textbooks, you know, mathematics series is very different from the earlier math books, right? So, that's a very clear signal that is there all along among the opinion makers, right? Because it is seen as competition. Uh, one education secretary very clearly said that, okay, up to secondary, I am willing to do something. Higher secondary must be competitive. And because it's about entrance exams, right? You touch Tamil Nadu books, right? You have a problem. CBSC does, I, we have to follow, right? If Andhra Pradesh does something else, you know, how can Tamil Nadu be left behind, right? So, competition is the name of the game, right? And in that, it's because... There are no jobs. There is, you know, this is not an econ the economic condition is not one where, uh, you know, guarantee is given through that. This is the passport and whatever delivers is what people go for. And syllabus committees and curriculum committees are subject to those pressures, right? Subject to enormous pressures on that, right? So, JE, NEET, the shadow is very, very long. The shadow of board exams is very long. Why is it otherwise you think about it? Class 7 September exam. If you look at the, if you just walk into any school and look at the, you know, what is called quarterly exam papers, right? They look, they're structured exactly like board exams, right? So it's the same absurdity. All along, that's what you want, you want to prepare for. It has nothing to do with all those activities that Rahul was talking about, right? Nobody will. And as long as exams are only that, preparation for that is exactly only that. And for children where there is no support at home, there is no other access to any other information, that becomes the norm. And, you know, there's a kind of happy equilibrium school provides what society wants, right? So, this is the sort of thing that is there. So, as far as those pressures are concerned, doing away with them, I think it's a different problem. 
it's a different problem where if people feel that there is a future assured right there is a life of dignity as i said where you can earn the pressure on the board exam will reduce we are very far away from that and like i said for a broad you know huge part of the country those are non issues parents don't have any right in education right they don't have any involvement in education and children are just there with no other support than what happens in the classroom thank you for the great talk sir i just want to acknowledge one of the points which i went through myself i belong to a state board school the excitement of doing science dies in the laboratory lab when we enter the lab there is a pre experiment experimented value which we should obtain at any cost so we never get the we never get the opportunity to uh experiment it so there is a pre experimented value but we do not get the opportunity to know how that the experiment has been done it should be done like this but we we never know what is what happening behind the scenes why we getting that value that one point i was very much i want to acknowledge this is happening to till today in the government schools yeah no so but that is why i said the alternatives are not that difficult when i was talking about the boiling point of sambar and all that that's what i was talking about it's a it's simply a reorientation it's a shifting of focus from something you know to something else that's all it is that's those are not the deep problems that we are talking about it's, that's what i mean by providing models providing resources we have to provide any number of such uh, projects right and do them with children and children will like them and they also understand science in a different way by doing it uh, thanks for a great talk uh, so uh, i was wondering as to what uh, like i would like to get your opinion as to what should be uh, the language is in which what should be the language in which uh, science or the general education should be uh, taught for example if if it's the regional language or the mother tongue obviously the the rural or the underprivileged people will uh, will get a benefit but that also kinds of uh, put them into a disadvantage if if they want to pursue a higher education or something so it so uh, uh, yeah so what what do you think interesting question see the point is that uh, uh, you know what do you mean by language i think we have to understand it a little bit i i do not see it as a problem of mother tongue right i mean i have talks where i can show you excerpts from state board textbooks and crt books uh, from math books typically what i have is all math textbook examples from tamil or hindi or malayalam or whatever right point is no mother speaks that tongue right no mother ever speaks that tongue it is not mother tongue it's a formal language and i think we should be that's why i talked about the language of mathematics and science and the exclusion that it brings right and i think this is very important to understand it's not about mother tongue right every child has home language the language that's spoken at home street language the language that you go and speak with friends and in shops and so on these two are already not the same and then the school language there is something like a school language which is not spoken on the street it's academic discourse right the correct term for it is academic discourse and then comes disciplinary language the language of science the language of mathematics and so on and remember what i said about the culture of quantification right the culture of quantification is integral to science that's why i mentioned things like estimation approximation and so on you know somebody who says without laws of generality is a mathematician right i mean these are all idioms right all like language has so and to be able to say plus minus 5% error bar right i mean it's a way of thinking it's a way of talking right so it's a formal language and the formal language needs to be acquired but what we need and i mean this is something like i don't know this is common sense we should let children talk their language in the classroom right whatever their language is children will find a way to negotiate all these and they must negotiate all these the point is if it's only the language they speak and the language of the textbook it's tyranny of the textbook right so and then that takes over now people with cultural capital cognitive capital can negotiate that right because you are at a home where you see people reading all the time reading becomes important to you you come from an agricultural family where nobody reads it's you know it's only textbook right i mean like for instance i grew up in 
Trichy and I then I read books in English. I remember I've said this many times. It was a discovery to me that I could read books in English. English was a subject, right? English is not something that, you know. And I was appalled and I was amazed that I could actually read books in English later on, right? I mean, I was in higher secondary by the time I realized that I could actually read books in English, right? So, you don't know what language you can speak and what you can't. Children don't know, right? Children need to be exposed, but unless, that's why I said children have to talk. They have to talk science. The language of mathematics in the classroom has to ease up, has to really ease up. It's not the formal language. And this is the point, right? Mathematicians, when they talk, they don't talk like their papers, right? You don't talk like your papers, right? You use all kinds of ambiguous language. You draw all kinds of bizarre things because with, you have the confidence that you can formalize it when you need to, right? Children don't have that, right? So children are not allowed an informal language at all. So we need negotiations. That's why I call it negotiation. We need children to free up the classroom so that they feel free to talk, right? I agree, mother tongue is important, but it's not so much mother tongue here, but you know, accessing the language of science with all kinds of imprecision, saying all kinds of wrong things. And we have done a lot of these, I mean, with children in many different contexts. There's even a research project where we are doing, where you actually work with children, let them talk freely, slowly they make their way. But we need patience. We need patience. It's also very difficult for you know, already crowded classrooms, already with tremendous pressures. It becomes yet another point of pressure on the teacher. So that's a problem. But we really need to move away from, uh, you know, if we can get rid of the tyranny of the textbook, get children to feel free to talk in their own language, things would be a lot easier. I think this is a good time to stop and can ask questions over email. I'm sure there are many more. It's such a fascinating talk. It's going to spin off many more discussions, but over email. Let's thank Professor Ramanujan again yeah. for a wonderful talk. Thank you.